The remarkable journey of Peter Knopf. Fixed up one of his early spear guns. I was a sporting guy, I think. You know, I wasn't that sort to travel to Taiwan and Korea, South Korea, and still buy a tank. You know, big guns, whatever else. And then the factory next door made the it. The first push was your way. And then Meyer was like an opening door. The Australian market was being affected by Amazon. And Amazon started. Was it easy to jump from one field to another from one company? We set up a big factory to make boats for the surf rescue and military and all sorts of other government. And people push you back straight away and say, oh, okay, no, it's too hard, it's something new, why would we? To eBay, look, I, I, I bought a second hand, something off them. Yeah, well, they're okay, but they can always hear the word niche. Find your niche market. Well, you can go to Kmart and spend three dollars on it. Your competitors now is the whole world. I've earned the right to do things differently. Peter, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Oh, oh, look, I think it's fantastic, and I really loved what you did. And especially watching a couple of those um, videos and my friend Marcy, you know, she was fantastic. And you yeah. got the best out of Marcy. So I thought, yeah, why not? Exactly. Thank you. So, Peter, I was wondering where do I have to start with you? I did a bit of Googling and search about you. Australian top 50 people in e-commerce, highly awarded CEO, uh, senior retailer specializing in digital innovation. And the list continues. I'm going to ask you if you're satisfied and you're happy with what you have achieved so far, but I, would, I don't actually want your answer now. So let's leave it to the, towards the end of the, this episode. Um, but let's start from where did everything start for Peter Knopp? From your childhood, where you grew up, and how did it progress? Yeah, it's hard to... Um... It's hard to think back, and it's fascinating. I was just having this discussion with my wife over the weekend, and you know, some things start to become a little bit fuzzier, or you remember them differently. You know, when you get together with the family and you start talking about childhood days, siblings, and all of that, and then your brother will say, "No, that wasn't what happened," <laughs> <laughs> or "Was that what happened? <laughs> was that the way it was?" <laughs> so it's fascinating how you, you, your mind can reassemble some things with I mean starting off with school and going through all of that and I started in sports pretty early on you know soccer football a anything with a ball with a bat and then started swimming and I swimming sort of took over as a child because you know I started to lose my good eyesight and had to wear glasses so you can't do that on a soccer field or a rugby field and Contact lenses weren't a thing back then. So I started swimming and got pretty good at that. And we got to travel a bit as a family because of the swimming, different events around the country. And so... Did you have a big family? Yeah, there's five of us oh. and five siblings and the folks. And we lived at Canterbury, near Canterbury Pool, fortunately, or unfortunately, as it turned out. But anyway, you live in the water. So then we started surfing and hiking and and dad in his younger days was a spear fisherman so I fixed up one of his early spear guns and started going spear fishing and learned all about that. Do you that. still do it now? Oh yeah so, absolutely yeah. yeah it's fantastic fantastic sport going to catch your own fish and then preparing them any way you like it's just one of those joys of life. Yeah yeah can guarantee it is. So you went to school you did your uh, normal school was it Normal school oh. through to HSC. Yeah. What do you remember of this phase? The uh, school was great for me. I, I, I just have good memories. Uh, everything uh, worked out pretty well. I got to be uh, class captain and then up to school captain. But that was mainly because I was a, I was a sporting guy. I think you know, I wasn't that smart. Uh, you know, I just made it through stuff. But um, because I was doing all right and I was a good image for the school, I think, you know, things were a lot easier than the average person. Did you feel that you would become a leader down the track? And this was like you had in mind since you were a kid? Oh, no idea. At all? No, yeah. no idea. I mean, that was back in the 60s. 
um, you know, the Italians started to come to school and the Greeks, you know, we'd, we'd never interacted yeah. living in uh, inner Sydney. You, you never met anybody else. Yeah. They'd start to come to school with their funny sandwiches and stuff. <laughs> and then we started to trade food and we thought, geez, how good is this? <laughs> so after school, you start going to your Italian mates' um, homes and, you know, the Italian mum always had food. Nice food. Nice food. <laughs> you know, the stuff you don't get at home, you know. Yeah. And we thought, how long has this been going on? And so that just sort of created a, a way of really understanding that, you know, the wider you engage with people and the more you learn, the uh, better off you are because there's so many interesting tracks you can go down. Yeah. And that started a lifelong love of food and cooking and mm -hmm. but just something else, just appreciating those things. So what was next up for after school? Did you start working or just like was? Yeah, school was always um, year-round swimming training, morning and night. So, um, And then after that, we would go and do the lawn mowing or whatever else we put around the neighbourhood to earn money. And weekends was working at the pool, doing you know all the, all the pool jobs, cleaning the pool through to lifeguard work and then swimming training. Became a swimming coach for a couple of years just after work. As soon as I left school, I got a job with uh, Tandy Electronics, my, my first ever job, and they'd just come to the country then, so I helped open their first store, and that developed an interest in electronics, I suppose, mm -hmm. and opening stores, learning about all of those things and making early circuit boards and things, so you've got to start to understand how things work. You think, oh, if I stick this resistor in here and, you know, early early um, transistors and stuff, they could be as big as a cigarette packet yep. <laughs> back then. And, the, you know, they hardly did anything except maybe turn to life on and off. So that was all great fun. And adventuring through electronics and putting uh, stereos in our cars and building them up and stereo systems and just just learning a whole heap around all of that audio technology and needles for record players back then and they still had eight tracks that was like the biggest business then and then of course cassettes and uh, records so you told me that you made a lot of money from selling needles yeah yeah, yeah absolutely so it was just unbelievable even back then that was um, mid seventies. You could spend hundreds of dollars on a, on a needle for a record player, and people did. So, did you stay in in technology and IT back then, or whatever you call it, like electronics, or you did something else? I went through a couple of roles and ended up in a in a hi fi company, and we used to design and develop our own speakers and um, technology as well. So. Uh, equalizers, amplifiers and things. So I got to travel to Taiwan and Korea, South Korea uh, and Hong Kong quite a bit uh, doing designing and buying. So I got involved in the, when I talk about designing, it's just the way it looks because the the bigger and the flasher and the more lights that had on it, mm -hmm. it used to sell back then. And so we sold the Hi-Fi with uh, big speakers to high department stores Lots of specialty stores, everybody. So that was a real interest. And, you know, I stayed surfing and skin diving and spear fishing, all of those things and activities. And at one point, um, I wanted an inflatable boat so we can get further off the coast and travel further with um, spear fishing. And Zodiacs at that time was pretty much all you could get. You could get sort of ex-military boats and things like that, but everything was expensive. So when I was talking about this with in Taiwan, in uh, Taipei, with uh, a colleague who was a supplier, he said, oh, you know, my, my brother knows somebody who makes those things. Let's go and have a look. So we went out the back blocks of Taipei, army surplus stores, you know, there's big warehouses out there. And back then you could still buy a tank. You know, big guns, whatever else, and then the factory next door made inflatable boats for Taiwan military and, and other purposes. So I bought one of those, put it in one of the containers of Hi-Fi and bought it back. And that started my adventure in boats. So did you start selling those boats in Australia or...? 
The first time I used it, went and bought an outboard. I went down to the boat ramp at uh, Cronulla in Burrinier Bay, and we went out and were spearing around Marley, came back, came back to the boat ramp, and there was all this interest in the boat. And I got so much interest that I, a couple of people's details and then ended up selling it to, to one of those guys who, who offered it the, an amazing amount of money back then. And so I thought, geez, here's an opportunity. So next time I went to Taiwan, I bought half a dozen boats and yeah. shipped them all back and then started selling them from the backyard. And after about six months, uh, started the business doing it. So what took you to IT and technology? If you were selling boats and through enjoying the, the surfing and the spearfishing? Yeah, through the 80s. I mean, one, once you start your own business, everything else falls away. Mm -hmm. You know, you... you I remember back then um, there wasn't such a thing as a girlfriend because, you know, you work every day and you're you're always doing something at night. Yeah. So for years you just work. But that was great fun, building boats, and we developed that business. And then we set up a big factory to make boats for surf rescues and military and all sorts of other government uses and bigger rigid hull inflatables. But setting up a factory in 1989 to 91, when interest rates went to 19%, wasn't such a great wasn't idea to expand. Exactly. So we had the Zodiac franchise. I had the Zodiac franchise. So we ended up selling that back and just got out of it with, after 10 years of working, with nothing. Minimal damage, yeah. And so I went to work on a marina selling large boats. And then a couple of years later, met my wife. And she literally said to me, you know, she agreed to get married, but she said, I want you to get a haircut and get a real job. <laughs> get out of this stuff. And so I went back to uni and I started doing an MBA. I thought this is the way to get ahead. And I was really interested in the learning and, and all, all of that. But um, working full time, seven days a week, and then trying to go to uni at night didn't sort of work out. So... I finished that, did a grad dip in finance and marketing there, and then I started MBA again part-time, doing it distance, and that made a hell of a difference. So I got a job at Meyer, just, just in a store running a section. But because I was in small business, I actually knew how to make money, and even it was a small section in a store. So I built on that and then ended up within 12 months as a state manager running that section because I knew truly how to buy, sell, trade, customer service, all of those things. And then within a few years at Myra, I was in national operations and merchandise. So these are the skills for a small business running. You have to know to do everything on, on your own? Literally everything. Mm. You, you sweep the floors, you watch the windows, and, and then everything else, deal with a bank manager, deal with suppliers, all of that relationship management stuff, stakeholder management, knowing not to piss off anyone, <laughs> or except some people that, you know, you didn't want to engage with anymore. So you've been quite selective. But it's interesting when you learn those skills when you're quite young, what you can do with them. Mm. So after Maya, that must have been like um, another push for Peter. Yeah. So, so we started with the first push was your wife saying, oh, Get a, haircut, get a haircut. Get a haircut. Get a and that was a George job. Thorogood song back then. <laughs> and then Meyer was like an opening door for Peter, which is give him an exposure to the retail industry and and progressing and this yeah. industry. And learning about large scale retail rather than the small scale retail yeah. and, and building operations that I was in. Um, I had the opportunity to go and work for Dimix. Dimix were after a marketing manager, but somebody who knew about e-commerce and websites. And all I'd known back then, I, I you know, would buy books online from the co-op. And the co-op in Australia was uh, Australia's first online retailer. And you know, from 93, you could start buying books online. And they'd been selling online for a long time. They're on most university campuses and a very large retailer. And they started in e-commerce early. So I, I knew how to put my credit card numbers into a computer and buy something and get it delivered. So I spun that into a story and did 
got into Dimix and they were just launching their first website. That was uh, two years after Amazon had started, but already the Australian market was being affected by Amazon. And Amazon started in books, and that's all they specialised in. But they could sell them and deliver them to Australia. You know, even back then, uh, 97, 98, cheaper than what you could buy them retail for here. Hmm. And everything was sold at retail back then, apart from the odd stock take sale and... Um, Boxing Day sale, those sort of things. So, so was it easy to jump from one field to another, from one company to another in different positions, or how did you? What was your secret? I think you learn to be um, just agile, and you learn to be engaged with people. And back then, you couldn't just go and buy a website. You couldn't sort of buy the software or anything else for a um, Shopify, big commerce, nothing. So you had to engage with people to understand how do you how do you develop pages how do I make a platform that I can put photos on and then move them around how can I change prices so it was literally understanding and engaging with lots of people back then to get these websites going and operating and building the sales and building the operations and so you took your concept uh, you saw an opportunity and an idea to expand it in Australia Obviously, you had a team that backed you up, like technical people, or people who just uh, build your websites, do your add-on. How did you do it? Yeah, you had to go and find people. You know, you didn't have people in your team that knew how to do this technical stuff. You start to have to hire people in. So you literally were, were just going around the market trying to find people that could do the tech stuff. Your IT people that used to be able to you know, plug in your your laptop and get it working or, you know, help you with an issue back then or help set up uh, your email, they weren't the same people that had the technical skills to create websites. It's all pretty well engaged now. And while we have lots of niches and specialists, back then one person just did one thing. So you built out your team and got your website going and then you had to cut deals with Australia Post, logistics providers, all of those things to understand how to scale profitably because Dimmix is a very large retail business but they were franchise, mm. very few company stores. So the franchisee said, we don't want anything to do with this online selling because you're taking business off us. And so we had to it's work. New technology, it's still hard for them to adjust. Uh, All of that, you're yeah. taking sales of us. And the website did really well uh, because Amazon had already sort of set the pace. So... Australian customers took to online ordering you know, very quickly. So it turned into a multi-million enterprise very, very fast. What was the hardest, um, I don't know, stage in this cycle? Was it selling your idea to the board, to the management, or um, different stakeholders within your environments? What obstacles did you find and how did you overcome these obstacles? Because obviously it's a new concept. And people will push you back straight away and say, oh, okay, no, it's too hard, it's something new, why would we risk it? How did you justify all of this? Book selling is very conservative. It's still a conservative business. I'm involved in uh, still book selling in, in different ways. But stakeholder management was everything because you literally needed millions and millions of dollars back then. There was just nothing like it is now, no software as a service, nothing. So after spending a couple of million dollars, we had a rudimentary site only and we could sell. And even with really basic sales techniques, as the sales started to climb, franchisees were getting more nervous. You're taking more sales off us. Who's getting the benefit of these sales? And the board kept saying, well, you need another million dollars, but you've already got this thing where you can go on and click a button and buy something. Say, so, yeah, but, you know, we need to do this customer experience, all of those things to keep growing. So it was just interesting. You just learn to engage with people but sell a story. Everything was about if we get this right and we do these things, this is what our future will look like. We will be an ingrained leading bookseller in Australia. Amazon won't be able to topple us if we do these things right. So just getting people aligned with your vision and then backing up to support and then coming up with other ways of stakeholder management so you could share 
the, the wins mm. and share the wins or profitability of the website amongst franchisees. So you work out ways how to do that and management and people come on board. Excellent. So you took the franchisees, you just you you made a big um, change in the whole cycle of selling and online and that was the first step of what we call e-commerce, correct? Correct. And then what was next after that? Well, eBay came to Australia about 2002 and I had a cat- one of my category managers. He came to me and said, look, eBay's been going for a while and they just approached me because they want to build out their books category so they can compete more with Amazon. I said, eBay, look, I, I, I bought a second hand, something off them. You know, they're okay, but they're going nowhere. You know, yeah. Stay with Dimmicks, you know, build your career here, <laughs> stay in the book business. You know, you get to meet all these fantastic authors, do all this stuff. And so he did for a few months, but then after three months, now he went to eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see eBay today. And, of course, I've done a lot of business with eBay you know, over the years. So that was really interesting how a marketplace, even back then, what's that, 22 years ago, started to grow and people started to make a living from eBay as individual sellers. So it didn't take long after e-commerce was only operating in Australia for a few years for people start to realise the opportunities that were there. How do you see the future of e-commerce overall, um, especially with the integration of AI now and creating more competition? It's easier to set up your environment and start competing. Well, Where's this industry going or this vertical specifically? What's really interesting about e-commerce now, it's just another channel. It's just like having a store except your audience is bigger. But you have to do all of those things really well. You know, the customer experience, the customer service, pricing, product supply, differentiation, all of those things, that's just, that's your base level of market. You have to be really as good as anybody else that's out there at those standard things and then do that something different. Offer that something different, whatever it is, whether it's the way you handle delivery or returns or deal with people or product specialisation. And I think what AI will do to this industry and any other industry, it's going to give you so many more options for change and experimentation and, and doing things differently. So, for example, in e-commerce, we've been using AI for years for website development Mm -hmm. and certainly product categorization. One of the biggest challenges used to be in e-commerce was you get all these new products in. Well, how do you get them up on screen? You know, have you got to photograph them? Can you you just download the catalogue, you know, from the supplier? But you have to do something different, present it differently, so you look different when the customer is searching. So it's not only being really good at SEO, it's about understanding, well, how can I do the blogs better? How can I do all the product tagging better? How can I automate things so I'm up there on Google? And AI has been enabling us to do that for years Mm. now. And that saves a huge amount of man hours that you've got to invest in other areas of the business. So if I I hear like your your story and how you started and different businesses and how you progressed. Every business was like a startup for you to some extent. Um, I always hear the word niche. Find your niche market. Focus on that. Uh, do do it well and then expand. Is this the right way to do it or you sh- do you do it differently? You shouldn't really focus on a niche market uh, and just try just to fish uh, horizontally rather than going vertically in, in one segment. What is your advice into that? I think it depends on your vision and your level of resources. So niche marketing, especially now, is is can be pro- quite profitable. If you get the right product and the right promotion and everybody's seen the Facebook ads on TV with thousands of posts and link and they're just selling one product. You know, it might be a watch or it might be a tent or, or an inflatable mattress. That's literally all, all they sell and focus on. I think starting in retail now and, and trying to build out an online business, and it's the same in retail, just on the main street or in a centre, 
you just have to understand what it is you need to do differently to get the customer's interest and, and get them engaged because customer lifetime value is pretty much everything. Mm-hmm. And you only have to do a couple of little things wrong and you lose that value and then it's expensive to go and find a new customer again. So once you understand that cycle and learn that value and you've got a niche that you can just concentrate on and grow out, it does need to be profitable. You invest a hell of a lot of not only your dollar capital but your human capital as well as you know all the other stakeholders of your family and everyone else's efforts in building a business. So you have to give everybody a payback. It's not just yourself. You have to offer everybody that opportunity to to benefit somehow mm. in the future. You, you mentioned something really interesting. Is like these days you sell one product. Um, I don't know. I've been involved in product creation a long time ago, and the cycle of a product used to go over 18 months to 24 months. What is the cycle? What is the life term uh, of a product now? Yeah, look, that's really fascinating. And it starts off with some cycles are now just a week. So there's companies out there that you can, product goes from runway into shops or onto an e-commerce site within a week. And the cycles have sped up so much. It's mostly fast fashion, of course. So it still fascinates me and enrages me to a degree why well, you can go to Kmart and spend three dollars on a T-shirt? You know, who, who, where is the value in that whole chain? And it's supposed to be organic cotton and this and that. It's just not possible. Yeah. So it makes you think when you go all the way down the supply lines to the chain, who is actually making that item and how are they being looked after? So even these jeans I'm wearing, it's a company called Outland Denim. And they're a specialist for purpose company. And they set up in Asia, principally with the sole purpose of giving uh, local women and disadvantaged women jobs. So they would make the jeans and make all of the denim apparel and their e-commerce marketed here. And they've actually been able to support a huge supply chain of women, manage the cotton buying, everything else, manufacture all the way through. So they're now supporting schools, daycare centres, healthcare for, for women on a very large scale. But so you, really you have to create your story before you create your product, before you start selling. And These jeans have a story. So not everybody can do that, mm. but it's, it's having that story that sounds convincing and being able to put it across in a way. You have to believe it yourself, of course, you know, the passion. Yeah. of being able to get people on board because you always need a lot of stakeholder support. doesn't matter whether it's from the financing or, or literally just opening the, opening the container or building something. Yeah. So, Peter, you've been the CEO of many um, uh, companies and, and, again, it's a different game all up. What is a CEO? How do you get – how do you work your way – um, up or down, I'm not sure, sometimes, just to get to this position. And is it an important position, really? Or is it really another product in your life that you just use on a short, short term and then you jump into something else? Yeah. Up, down, sideways, backwards. Yeah. It's fascinating. And I think it's a little bit around being able to have that vision and, and being able to engage with people and manage your stakeholders well, but you've got to actually like people. You know, there's some research around that says, um, you know, some CEOs are, you know, are the biggest psychopaths in, uh, that you will ever find. And that's probably true to a degree. And there's some pretty interesting characters that are CEOs of big companies around the world when you look at it. But overall, it's about literally being engaged with your teams and being able to motivate them and and sell that future. This is what we can do together. And if we achieve these things, this is what the business is going to look like. So your families will be so much better off. Salaries will be so much better off. Everything we do is you'll be so much better off. So it's everybody, doesn't matter who they are in the company, has to have some benefit. 
from that growth. And if they can see that and connect together, well, if I do this and I support them and to do this well and make sure I turn up, this is the outcome I'm going to have. I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's around being able to work with people, motivate them, of course, but just offer them something in the future, something that's going to come out of that effort. So what made Peter Nock a good CEO? Like, obviously, you did reflect a bit and you know exactly where you succeeded and when you failed. Where was the highlight? What was the Peter gave to the market and to the shareholders and to the employees that made him shine in this industry? It was probably differing things for different businesses, like you know the digital startups that I had working through the large retail operations that I would lead or even working within our industry sector and our industry organisations. So it is literally, I think, no more complicated than just listening to people, you know, having the respect for what you're saying, understanding it, and, you know, then working through all of these different ideas. You can't have every idea. You have to rely on the teams around you. If you don't get that, you know, totally engaged support, you, you won't do very well. You won't get to where you need to go. So do you take the feedback seriously and you review them and say, okay, well, I have to review every single feedback? Or how does it work? Yeah, stay close to your customer is one thing. So no matter what business you're in, you you, you handle the feedback as much as you can. Mm. And so you understand from the horse's mouth what, what the issue is. And that's one thing. But your teams, doesn't matter who it is in your team, have them as level as possible, as fat, as flat okay. as possible. And just listen to what they're saying, understand what they're doing and understand what their issues are and work through those. Not every idea you hear, like you'll come along and say, oh, yeah, we ought to do this, do it this way. And I say, Roland, that's a shit idea. Well, you don't say that. You just exactly. sort of work around it and say, oh, okay, if we did this, that would mean that and work through that. I don't think that's going to work out the way we want. But if we came around and did it this other way, um, we would be much better off. So it's not dissing ideas, but it's helping people understand whether it would work or not, or maybe work in the future, or maybe work in another situation or engagement or something else that you're going to do. So normally these positions are very competitive. There's a lot of politics involved, um, and there's a lot of navigation and building team and background and propagandizing your, your skills and your values within just to get these positions. Um, how much politics really are in just is involved just to get these positions, the high level CEO positions? There's politics in everything, doesn't matter what you do. Um, I'll, I'll go home and I'll have to negotiate, you know, di <laughs> different things. So whether you go home and do it with your kids or, or whatever else, there's politics and everything, and it's understanding those. And politics aren't necessarily a bad thing, and I won't go into state and, and uh, federal issues. But it's understanding that. But if you're not good at engaging with people, listening and understanding the real issues, you, you can't be successful anyway. So it's the same thing. And that's the political management is being successful and being good at something and helping people understand so probably a CEO's role, about 90% of the effort, time you engage with is helping people understand not only the issues, the history, but where we're going and what we'll look like when we get there. So it's handling that whole process well, using all the tools and people around you. Excellent. You know, um, this is a fast-moving environment, technology overall, uh, IT and programming, everything you do in, in this field is really moving fast and you have to always keep on learning. How did you keep up with this? Did you have to just to keep on learning new stuff and being up to date? I think there was trade-offs with your time. You only have so much time and it's, you know, it's no cliche that time is the most valuable asset you have. So you have to learn how to use that properly. You know, I, I want to go surfing every day because that's good for my soul and good for my 
uh, body as well. But sometimes you have to trade that off because you know you have to concentrate on these board papers. You know you have to learn about this particular technology to ensure you stay on top of it. So if you're not naturally curious about these things, that's hard work. You know, the competition to do something else is always different. And it's being able to focus for the amount of time that you have available to get the lessons you need mm. out of that and then be able to take them forward. Do you have to specialise in one field or it's better if just keep your doors open to different fields? I think it's understanding where to find the service you need because all of us have something different to offer. I can't do what you do, you can't do what I do and and Fred over there and Mary over here, you know, everyone has something to offer. So it's just understanding how they can fit in and create, you know, one plus one equals three. That's what you're always looking for, not only as a CEO, but in anything we do. Yeah. Look, money is also a major role, especially uh, um, an important factor um, in any position that you take or you progress to. You ask yourself, am I really being uh, compensated well? Um, is it the first question that you have to ask yourself or you have to look at something else as part of the package during your your progress, your career progress? And these things, um, money and helping you manage family, uh, are, are all really deeply ingrained and personal. So we all have these things that need us need to drive us and, and actually motivate us. So it's understanding what it is that you need to be able to achieve that and ensuring that you always negotiate a package, whatever that looks like, that you need. Because if you're not able to serve your family and, and benefit the, those around you very well, you're going to really struggle yeah. in doing anything because the pressure that's coming up all the time becomes very difficult to handle. I'm glad you did mention uh, family, yeah, because it does play a major role uh, in your life. How did you navigate through your family needs and your business needs, especially that you had to work long hours and keep on traveling most of the time? How do you juggle between the two? No, it's, it's having really good support, and, and you have to earn the support. You have to earn the right to be able to do the things that you do and to take the risks and to, you know, if you want to remortgage the house again or put on a third or a fourth mortgage, <laughs> you have to ensure that the support is there and you're, that you can be able to achieve what you need to achieve because otherwise the pressure gets pretty great. So you've got to manage the pressure, manage all of those things, but it's just communication. And again, talking about the future all the time, what the future will look like, how it could be. And if it fails, well, this is what we'll do. So you need a backup plan. Excellent. No, it's, it's good that you mentioned pressure too, because it, it does relate to this environment also. Um, your mental health and your physical health, two important things. Um, Interrelated. Literally, you have to manage both. And it starts with physical health. So, you know, we get up at five every morning and go for a, a long walk and engage and then come back and do whatever we need to do before we engage in the day. It doesn't matter where I am. If I can't get a surf in, it's a walk or try and get a surf in during the day or at least an ocean swim. But keeping yourself physically active um, it can get challenging, but if you don't, this suffers up here and you start to lose a bit of confidence in yourself. So if you lose confidence in your physical ability, uh, you, you start to lose confidence in other areas, I find. Mm. And so it's managing all of those things. And some things you've got to trade off other things, but just ensuring that you, you eat well, you live well, and you just reflect on your own values so where do you draw the line and say, okay, I'm, I'm working really hard, long hours, I'm on the edge of collapsing, completely burnout. out. How do you draw the line? Is it something that you do personally or you wait for signals from your environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge. Mm. And I've seen people go too far over the edge 
I mean, I think everybody has their own way of dealing with these things and you can probably read books and listen to podcasts, how to manage these things. And for me, it's ensuring that I listen to music, I have time to exercise and it's the mental state that you put yourself in. If you start to have less confidence in something, whether you're in a role or doing something or doing a project, you really need to understand what that is. You know, what's your gut telling you about this issue, whether it's here, physical or a business issue, and 99% you're better to follow your gut. So sometimes you just have to make a 90-degree turn, change, just drop something altogether, understand how to say no. Mm. That's one of the biggest challenges, and you're better off to learn that very early in your career how to not take on too much because that'll always get get on top of you. Yeah, Changing means sometimes relocation, selling your house, uh, going into different countries. Would you advise um, the new generation to do that? Just to take any opportunity they can get or how does it work? Yeah, that's always fascinated me. I've worked uh, around Asia Pacific. Um, I haven't worked in Europe and I've done a bit of work in the U.S., and around and we do business in in every uh, locale but a, a colleague that I'm working with on a small startup him and his wife they've only been married uh, 10 months they just decided to relocate to Canada and so they sold up and have just moved to to Vancouver so they're starting a, a whole new adventure there he's um younger than I but he's just but yep I can still manage the all the work I need to do on the board and, and with the startup and all the tech work, but I want to go and do this. So people with a vision or people with just the ability to be able to say, yeah, I just want to do something different, and but I can see how I can get there. It's just risk management, I think. At the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Whatever the safety net is that you, you need to have in place, you sort of have it in place um, and you just go for it. So the success comes with the safety net or you have to always don't worry about your safety net, take your risk and opportunities and progress. Well, what is more important, really? Oh, I think it depends on how good your mental state is at managing yourself mm. and the resources around you. You have to understand that. And I've done things um, there where I haven't had a safety net. I've just... But no, this is going to work and you just make it work. You know, you have to because there's no plan B. So <laughs> yeah, you have to succeed. You have to succeed. But that's not for everybody. You know, there's you have to have the personality. You have to be crazy enough just to, to do that. Maybe just on the edge, but you have to have a real understanding of your surroundings yeah. and, and your own ability. You know, it's not just hype. You know, I can't say, Roland, you know, go and do this because... You're really, really good at it. Yeah. Don't believe me. Make your own call. Mm. Check with your own uh, shareholders and stakeholders, which is your family and colleagues. Mm. So if you go back, I don't know, like five years ago or more, in your interviews uh, with the people who used to employ, I'm sure you used to ask them, like, what is your plan what is your future plan, the two years, three years, five years plan, and so on, which is like very essential questions in, in, in any interview that you do. So what is planning these days? Can you really plan? Can you say, okay, this is what I'm planning to do for the next two, three years, five years, or you take it as you go? How, what is it now? Well, you can do that. You can say, have your plan and your program all laid out and go for it. That's great. But you never know what's going to happen next week, let, let alone tomorrow. And so companies that you're engaged with, you know, forward planning is a fascinating process. You have to be much more agile than you ever were in the past. You know, it's not only plan B, but it's plan C and plan D because the variations and the variables now, both ways, you know, upwards and downwards, are much more significant mm. and they can be much greater. Your competitors now is the whole world. You know, whatever industry it you're is in, really. whatever <laughs> business, it's it's a flat world. Yeah. Uh, so 
next year you're going to have more competitors than you did today, whatever business you're in, because it's the opportunity to engage and start up is so little now compared to doing other things. And AI will only make that much more competitive. Mm. So just being able to be as agile as possible and understand the level of resources that you have and different ways you can jump and move is probably more important than anything else at the moment. I think you gave a very good hint today for our viewers. You have to do things differently, which is how you differentiate yourself from everyone else and then just move up or down if you can. Social marketing, social life, your LinkedIn profile, your um, Facebook, uh, your Instagram. How much do you get involved with that? Is it really important for for yourself just to keep yourself in the market? I think with there's the business side and then there's the social side. So the social apps are, are there for engaging with family and, and keeping Zuckerberg. Uh, uh, one of the richest people in the world. That's important to him. And we, and we all know now, if we start talking about something, hey, Roland, I'm really interested in going to New Zealand next week, suddenly it'll appear on one of your Facebook ads, yeah. deals, <laughs> whatever it is. So whether it's on, coming up on Google or TikTok, you know, you, you see it. So you don't own yourself anymore and, and you never will again. You know, Web3 will allow us to have, Different, differing levels of in privacy and engagement, but that's that's a whole other situation. Microsoft and uh, Meta and Google, they aren't going to let us go so easily. Yeah. They're the, the megaliths. But utilising LinkedIn is a good way to keep yourself honest as well because whatever base you present to yourself on LinkedIn, that's about saying this is who I am and this is what I do but also this is what I'm going to do. People read that in whatever it is they're reading about you. Mm. So you have to be really straightforward, honest and engaged because it's like uh, putting out there your future plan, your forward plan, and people will just automatically judge you on that. With the social media these days, do you feel that you are safe? The, um, especially that all what we're hearing about cybersecurity issues and threats and, you know, stealing IDs and identities. And so how do you manage that? Or you really don't have to worry about it this much and let it be? I think it, all you can do is have the best protections that, that you currently are available in the market. You have to keep upgrading because um, that's a whole industry in itself and they're going to keep getting better and better at stealing your stuff. Um, so you have to just manage as best you can and do all the things that uh, are around cyber security that people recommend. I'm no safety expert, but every day it's going to get more challenging and more challenging. So what do you do then if you get hacked or like, is it the end of the world or is it something that you learn? And, and as you said, like you have to make sure that you ticked all the boxes what the experts are telling you to do, you don't. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work at the end. You just got to have all of those things in place and your fail safe plans and, you know, what happens if this happens or this is what you do, this is your plan, this is your reporting system, this is your recovery systems and all of that. And to a degree, hope for the best. I mean, you and I, with size companies that we're involved with, we see every day nearly... You know, the biggest companies in the world having problems, having issues. Yeah. So we just have to look after ourselves, look after our own interests as best we can, protection-wise, let alone the businesses that we work with. And it's always a plan. Have a plan and have a fallback plan and then hope for the best. Exactly. So, Peter, you have been involved in this industry for many, many years. Um, what do you think will be the next big thing? that will hit this industry and make a big difference. Yeah. I've always wished I could read the future because I'd be much better off. So maybe reading the future is an application that... I, th I think you can utilise AI to tell you the future, but AI currently is everything we've done in the past yeah. and what we've done now. So it's probably not so good at being able to predict the future yet, but it's going to 
start to understand us in the future much better than we understand ourselves. So it's going to be an interesting tipping point. We get to that. You know, some of the original AI experts are got their black hats on and they're warning everybody what's coming down the road. We just don't know, but we've got to work with it because it's not going away. There's, whether it's a bad actor engaged in it or a good actor engaged in it, there's going to be a whole new world that's just going to play out. And we've just got to be agile enough to do the best we can with what's coming down the road. Do you actually debate this or you just accept it and then work with it? What do you do these days? Well, every conference you go to or wherever you're speaking or if you're on a panel, all of these things come up all the time, you know, what ifs, what ifs. And I don't know, there's no magic answers, but it's just listening to people, understanding what's happening. Every day there's a new technology or a new company coming out in e-commerce that's promising to do this or can do that. There's startups galore. And there's still people's bedrooms projects coming out of COVID development that are just starting to get some runs and get some exposure. So there's a huge amount that's coming down the road and we only understand this much of it. So it's that agility and, and being curious and open to learning and understanding and understanding how that can fit. Our technical debt now, you've got to be able to minimise that as much as you can because you may have to use a totally different platform in a year's time. Use totally different technology and service providers to what you currently have. We don't know, oh. but you really need to get to that point where headless truly means headless. You know, you, you can have any opportunity to plug into your base processes, base systems, and they're not always technical. We didn't talk much about Australia overall. But, um, do, do you see that Australia plays any role in the future development of technology around the world? Oh, we've got some real leaders. It's quite amazing the amount of people that we have that uh, expand overseas and do different things. and So why would they expand overseas rather than just use the Australian market to expand? Well, some businesses, and Canva is a good example, they're, they're a, a very valuable company now, but they couldn't actually raise the capital that they needed. So they had to go to the US and everybody has those stories and they know somebody has had to do that. But in the main, technology in Australia, we've got 20-odd million people. And so we just don't have the resource base that Europe and the US has. So it's quite often there's much more experienced people over there, whether it's capital management, venture capital, human capital, whatever it is that you need to engage with. So not everybody within your circle has that understanding or knows things. But... You know, this was it always the case, or it has changed lately? No, I think it's always the case. Always now the it case. just moves faster mm. because everybody has much more access. Now that we have a flat world, everybody has access to the same information. It's just you'll read something, and I'll read something. We may see different things. Yeah. And then it's how we use that. You know how we put things together to get a different result. Excellent, Peter. Before we wrap up, what is your advice to? The new generation, those kids out there now, they're listening to you and watching you from your experience in this field. Um, do you advise them to progress into this field or what is your advice to them? Well, you hear people say, follow your passion. You, you need to do that because otherwise you don't have the motivation to do different things. But you can manage your passion in different ways as well. So in a, literally it's understanding what you're good at, building on that, reinforcing, you know, your weaknesses, either through the learning, education, um, being open to do things differently or having support people around you that can fill in all those blanks. I think it's utilising everything that we have available to us now and the opportunities that we have are so much wider than they've ever been, but it's just understanding how to use them. But it's always going to come back to your vision, your passion and the way you go about doing it but have a dream, literally have a dream. And follow your dream. As best you can. Exactly. You might have to park it sometimes, but that's fine. Look, I did ask you the first question, like in, in this episode, on um, if Peter Nock is really satisfied in what he has achieved 
in his life so far. What is your say on that now? It's really interesting when you start to reflect on what you have done or achieved. Would you change things in the past? Well, of course you would. You know, there'd be things you do differently. But overall, I'm at a point where I'm very satisfied with what I do, what I've achieved. I've earned the right to do things differently. And I do. Now, the way I work with people, the way I work with industry and individual companies... But if you haven't earned that right, you'll have all sorts of other issues in in managing yourself or or your families as well. So uh, I'm fairly fortunate. I always say fortunate. Some people say lucky, but you make your own luck, really, especially over a a longer life you have, the luckier you need to be, which means you need to work smarter, not necessarily harder. But it's being able to do the things that you want and you're more passionate about rather than having to do things, having to satisfy somebody else. You're learning how to say no, and you do the things that you're really happy to do. So what is next for Peter? Uh, I'm doing everything that I'm very happy about. And again, COVID's long gone now, so it's getting back to a more normal life of travel, engagement, and business. We all love doing business on a screen because it's so much more efficient. You know, you can have 10 meetings in a day instead of four. But it gets to a point where there's that human engagement, that human understanding. It's uh, you just need to go and do the things you want to do. Peter, thank you so much for being here today. Um, Tell us about your experience with Brainsplot and what is your recommendation to the other guests? One of the reasons I want to to get involved was because I saw my colleague Marcy being interviewed so well, but also learning a lot more about her than I just didn't know and understand. So I like people that literally have a go, have a dream and set about achieving that. And I think what you've been able to achieve with Brain Splat is allowing people to tell their stories and levels of experience, which there's always something somebody can learn off that not that you're a teacher, but nobody's had your life. Nobody's had your personality or probably fortunate for that. (laughs) But everybody learns something off everybody and the different things that people have done are actually quite amazing. You know, you listen to somebody talking, how did you do that? How did you get to that point? But building on those sort of lessons and being curious, I think, uh, is probably one of the greatest traits to have. So I congratulate you on Brain Splat. Thank you. And I look forward to the education that people who watch this series uh, can achieve. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Previously on Brain Splat. A man or spy would be a great way to America did truly believe the rest of the world. Obviously, South Korea was a challenge for them. Yeah. It was funded by a Dutch company that needed someone that could speak to So you crossed the bridge. I crossed the bridge. You never looked back. Yeah. Outside of Chicago, did not have a passport. So from diplomacy, espionage <laughs> to technology and IT. And invented with the philosophy, in the case of Microsoft, around... But how do I trust the output? Do I just take it? I mean, it's it's going to have that black box element you don't understand. We're talking about executive sponsorship or playing the right politics with Some it? Some of the concerning uses of AI around upcoming elections. I think, are we doing enough to have our voice? Right? And I'm passionate about voting as an American abroad because... What do you see next for this industry? So when you say Helen back, what does it mean? Fumal of like cops everywhere, chasing everyone, helicopters, and, and it was really bad. Mm. And you kept getting nerves and nerves and nerves. And I was willing to do anything. I needed, I didn't have a choice. And I remember that day. And, and it saved your life. It saved my life. And what happened then? What my, was your reaction? My friend went, and two of them didn't come back. Oh the one sort of redundancy, left, right, and center. People worried there. Uh, and all you want me to go to work every day, my head's down. In the corporate world, there was no genuine. Everyone like uh, they were trying to climb the ladder. They're going through redundancies. They're hesitant to change their jobs. They're doing something in which they don't actually like. I work for that company. I'm not working a charity. I'm getting paid what I get paid for. So September 11 really shook the world at that time. So there's no decision making. Mm-hmm. That really 
I'm thinking, okay, make a decision. Do you want me to build this or you don't want me to build it? Mm. <laughs> People think uh, war is a, is a game. Uh, it's a game you play on Xbox or... You want my other things now? Yeah, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, when you press delete, oh my it's God. all gone. And that's what happened. I press delete and all gone.